This morning on BRN, what goes into all those prices at the grocery store? Joining me now to discuss this, David Anderson is an economist and professor at Texas A&M University. David, so great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Hey, it's great to be with you this morning. Yep, and you're right in the throes of the uh, new semester and teaching graduate level economics. I wanted to ask you, since we have you, uh, what goes into the prices of the food that we buy at the grocery store? Oh yeah, that's great, because that's certainly been in the news lately, you know, about really? grocery store prices in, in the context of this overall, you know, consumer price index and what's happening. So, you know, if I, I think about going to the grocery store uh, and I, you know, if I think about all the things that are part of that, uh, well, gosh, you know, the first thing right in front of us is the lights are on, there's people working there. Uh, you know, there's certainly people busy moving around, stocking the shelves. Uh, so you right away that should tell us, well, gosh, we got energy prices, we've got labor, uh, you know, wages. Uh, we've got, I look around parts of the store, certainly there's packaging. Uh, and you can look around and say, well, gosh, I got styrofoam things, I got uh, plastic wrap, I got cardboard, you know, all. Of, and so right away, just at the grocery store part, there's a whole bunch of things right there that don't, that aren't directly tied to say the the price of what the grocery store paid for the meat or the bread itself. And so you have all of that. And, and at the kind of the processing level where we, where we turn the stuff into the consumable part, you know, we got all those same things too, packaging labor, uh, keeping the lights on, all of that stuff, keeping the coolers on so it stays cold. Uh, and, and then we get finally to the cost of producing the actual food itself, the wheat, the beef, the pork and everything else. Yeah. And, and David, so, the, you know, the lights being on the, when the, when the grocery store price. So each grocery store. Well, let me ask you this it, this way. Each brand of grocery store, whether it's a Whole Foods, a Harris Teeter, a Giant, you know, wherever you are, wherever you shop, there are certain brands they derive the price of a particular good based on all those what economically you would call an input. Is that correct? Yeah. What's the cost to produce this and, and get it to the shelf? Right. And, and so that, that would explain the, you know, the, the price of electricity uh, or energy has gone up. Uh, the cost of labor, you got to retain people. You got to bring people in. You got to offer them benefits. It's not just 10 people that just work the cash registers. There's probably what, upwards of 20 to 50 people in a grocery store that are doing some of the behind the scenes work, unloading trucks. There's costs and varying de de degrees of compensation there. Absolutely. And you know, the grocery store business historically has been one that's a very low margin, a very tight margin. We have, you know, a, a I might argue a fairly competitive market. And so you got your different grocery stores in your area competing to get you in the store. They're offering coupons. They've got the, you know, your, your loyalty card, all of those things to get people in the store, in their store rather than someone else's. And so historically, it's typically a, a fairly low margin business across the entire store and, and all the different segments. So we got a produce, we got a meat case, we got, you know, the dairy case, eggs, and then all the stuff in the center of the store and so we can think of each one of those as being these different kind of centers or, or profit centers of the store. Right. And, they're, and those are the inputs that get imputed into calculating the cost. David, does it matter? Uh, you think about some of the brands. I named some of them, not by which, none of which are, by the way, sponsors of the program. But is there a benefit to being a large organization such as a Costco or a Sam's Club versus a smaller like a bodega in New York City or a smaller mom and I'm going to call it mom and pop or mom and mom, pop and pop uh, store. Are there advantages to either or? Well, you know what? They may all have different cost structures. Uh, you know, you would think of a big, a great big chain or a big store might very well have, be, have some ability to price things or, or their, their costs may be lower uh, because they're able to do volume. They're able to do a, a huge, you know, really large volume, and they may be a nationwide chain. And so they're able to use that ability to buy volume to, to have lower costs. 
as, a, as opposed to, say, a really small one location store somewhere that may not stock enough volume to be able to get maybe the best price from their suppliers or the lowest price for their suppliers. And so you could think of some uh, really different cost structures between those two types of stores that relate to also uh, you know, your the the price that consumers pays at, at pay may pay at one store versus another. So right there, that might tell you we might have some really wide differences in grocery store prices between those types of locations. Yet that smaller store may provide some different services. Uh, they may be your local uh, store that you know the people there that you do business with that you uh, you may feel like you get a, a different level of service. Uh, it may also be convenient because it's right there. And so yeah. and you got a whole different thing. It's not just the goods on the shelf, but that array of services that go with that. And, and David, to that point, maybe a little bit lower overhead. Uh, you talked about some of these input costs, the electricity, the staffing. That that's So you can make it up if, if in a larger organization. You have buying economies of scale and the ability to you know buy at a lower cost because you're buying in higher volume on the, on the, but you have these input costs in terms of electricity and labor, the smaller end, they may, they, they may have less overhead costs in terms of number of staff and electricity. And so that would be reflected in the prices as well. So there could be actually be parity between the types of prices you're seeing. Yeah. It's just that the costs are coming in in different places. The, the input, you know, buying it, you know, the wholesale items that you're going to put on the shelf versus kind of the overhead side of it. And those two may also have very different demands on the company from investors. Uh, one may be a publicly traded large company and you've got a stock market uh, going on there versus one is a small thing that doesn't have those. And those may create uh, different demands on returns uh, or profit margins. And so, uh, those may be very different. Yeah. And last question for you, David, what about quality? Uh, can you get, d depending on the larger store or the smaller store, does quality vary? So does the smaller store still get access to the best produce, the best meat cuts, uh, all the things that, you know, when you're buying in bulk, you have a better, better um, buying power. Maybe, you, you know, theoretically, maybe you would have better opportunities for better, better produce, et cetera. You know, you could see uh, differences in quality. In fact, in, in fact, in some of those stores, they could have the same wholesale supplier. Uh, it could actually be the same. Uh, but you may also have some different ones, some more niche products or things that you may think of as a, gosh, that's a better quality product. And that's probably sort of in the, in the, the eyes of us as consumers, am I getting this the service, the quality of product, am I happy with what I'm getting there? But it could be too that the wholesaler's the same person. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Well, David, we're going to have to leave there. Really, you know, being that you're an ec economic professor or, or teacher, but or perfect doctor of economics, but also you have a lot of expertise in cattle and corn and all these other uh, and grains and all these other parts of the economy. Really interesting conversation as to what actually goes into pricing food. We're going to have to leave it there. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. And we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Well, thanks again. This has been great. And don't forget to subscribe to our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse, for all the news in one place. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN. I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe. Keep on saving. And don't forget, roll with the changes.